to the Prevailing Word Podcast. I'm Fred Rochester. Thanks for tuning in. Let's get right into today's message from the Word of God. Please open up your Bibles to the book of Matthew, the fifth chapter, and we will begin at verse 13, salt and light. Matthew chapter 5, beginning at verse 13. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing, but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world, a city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Father, we thank you that your word tells us that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for teaching for reproof, for instruction in righteousness, and for correction, that the man of God may be thoroughly furnished unto every good work. We thank you, Father, that the word of God is alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, the joints and marrow, and as a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. We thank you, Lord, that the entrance of your word gives light, it gives understanding to the simple. We thank you, Lord, that every word of God is pure and you are a shield to those who put their trust in you. We thank you, Lord, that you desire truth in the inner man and in the hidden part you will make us to know wisdom. And we thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Here we see that the Lord calls us to be not only salt in the earth, but also to be the light of of the world. In our morning session we saw a scripture uh, that referenced that Israel was to be that light and that as a result of Israel walking in their sins that the Lord would take away that light. But here we see the Lord bringing back uh, the intent that God wants his people to be light. Now of course Jesus was speaking to the Jews in the book of uh, Matthew chapter 5 because Remember what Paul said in Romans chapter 1 and verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And so uh, we also know that in uh, the book of John, Jesus explained to the Jews that uh, actually to the woman at the well in Samaria, that salvation is of the Jews in John chapter 4. And so the Jews were to resume that light, but only if they believed in, in the Son, but they rejected the Son of God. They rejected this light. And now we see John chapter 10 come into play where Jesus said, I have sheep that are not of this fold. Them too I must bring in. And so the Gentiles is that sheep that Jesus is referring to and that now this message about being the light of the world that was given to the Jews and they rejected Christ, it now falls upon us as true believers in Christ Jesus. Go to the book of Acts chapter 26. Acts the 26th chapter. And here we see Paul standing before the Gentiles giving him his uh, discourse or a recount of the uh, the call of, of Christ on Paul on the road to Damascus. Uh, look in uh, uh, Acts chapter 26 beginning at verse 12. While thus accompanied as I journeyed to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priests in other words Paul requested letters to go and pursue Christians in Damascus and he was granted uh, the letters and he was commissioned by the chief priests. Verse 13, at midday, O king, along the road, I saw a light from heaven. 
brighter than the sun. Now we know that the Bible tells us in the book of James chapter 1 and verse 17 that every good gift and every perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights. So the Lord is the ruler of the lights and he will not allow the lights that he created outshine him. So on the road, Paul saw this light from heaven brighter than the sun. Now we all know that if we were to look up into the sun with our naked eye, and you're not supposed to do that because it could do damage to your retina, that when we look at that light, that it will do damage. But there was a light that was shining brighter than the midday sun. And this light, Paul said, shining around me and those who journeyed with me. And when we all had fallen to the ground, I heard a voice speaking to me and saying to the he saying in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So I said, Who are you, Lord? <laughs> you just, I, well, you got to understand something. We're talking about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So it could be that Paul knew this and wanted to rec wanted to wanted to find out which one. And a lot of people have trouble with understanding that the Lord our God is one. And Jesus said the Lord our God is one. And so then how can Jesus be one with the Father? Very simple. I, am my I and my Father are one. Alright? So you're equal with God. But in terms of preeminence. You have God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Three distinct persons. Not it's things, force, power. No, no. Persons. Remember what it says in the book of Genesis chapter 1. Let us make man in our image. You see, we're made up of three separate parts or tripartite, if you will. We have a spirit which is our breath which came from God that gives us life. We have a soul which makes up and comprises of our emotions, of our will, of our intellect, and of our personality. And we have a body which is the container that allows us to travel on this physical earth. So we're made up of three things, yet we're one. We're three distinct things, yet we're one. Just like God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, they're one. Now people will say, well, I just don't understand. Well, you'll get used to it. You just need to hear it often. So who, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus. So he identified the Lord that appeared to him in this light that is shining brighter than the midday sun. I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Now notice that when you persecute me, you're persecuting the Jesus within me. Now remember what John chapter 15 says. John chapter 15 says that, that the, the world hates, hates you. But know that it hated me before it hated you. So whenever you're persecuting a child of God, you're persecuting Jesus. Now, now here's a warning. It would be better that a millstone be hung around your neck and you be cast into the sea than to harm one of these little ones. So whenever you're persecuting a child of God, you're persecuting the Christ that is in that child of God. You're persecuting me. Is it hard? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So I said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. But rise and stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose. Now Jesus can appear to anyone at any time, and there's nothing you can do about it. But Jesus appeared to Paul. Now a whole lot of people say, well, that's it. There's no more appearances. Well, you got to be very careful of that. Because if he decides to appear to people, what are you going to do about it? There's nothing you can do about it. Well, I just don't believe it. We'll just stay with the scriptures. Well, that's fine. Stay with the scriptures. But, you know, he is, remember one thing. He is God. 
and he can appear anytime he want to you so who are you to tell God the rules by which he appears in fact the scriptures tells us in the book of 1st Corinthians that who, who who has instructed him since when we instruct God we don't so he came and said for I appear to you for this purpose to make you a minister and a witness both of the things which you have seen and of the things which I will yet reveal to you I will deliver you from the Jewish people as well as from the Gentiles to whom I now send you to open for what purpose to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light and that's the whole purpose of the gospel the whole purpose of the gospel when when it is preached is to turn people from darkness to the light and from the power of Satan to God so now we know who's behind the power of darkness Satan is and we now know who is Lord over the light God is why because we again what we said what we saw in James chapter 1 and verse 17 that every good gift and every perfect gift comes down from the father of lights so to turn people from the power of Satan to God that they may receive and here's the purpose that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me in Jesus the inheritance is not talking about a house a car money clothing things of that nature it's not talking about that the inheritance is our eternal inheritance in Christ. In fact, go to the book of Romans, chapter 8. Romans, the 8th chapter. Look at verse 12, starting there. Romans 8 and verse 12. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. Uh, this word Abba does not mean Daddy. Please don't call God daddy. That's an earthly thing between a father and his children. God, we don't call God daddy. We may say Abba Father, and that's the limit. But we don't, we don't, we don't equate earthly terms with our heavenly Father. In fact, in fact, when you read the book of uh, Matthew chapter six, when the disciples asked the Lord, "Teach us to pray," He said, "Our Father." Whenever you see Jesus acknowledge the Lord God, he would always call him father, not daddy. So be, be very careful with that. In fact, it is Aramaic. The word Abba is Aramaic. Uh, verse 16, meaning that it comes from the Aramaic language. Verse 16, the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God. See, if you're heir, you receive an inheritance. If you're in Christ, you receive an inheritance. So the inheritance is not house, it is not cars, it is not money, it is not clothing. The inheritance is the eternal inheritance of eternal life that we've received through Christ Jesus as a result of repentance from dead works and, and faith towards God through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Again, verse 17, and if children, then heirs. If you're a child of God, you're an heir. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. So, go back to Acts chapter 26, look at verse 18 again. Paul's assignment from, from the Lord Jesus Christ, because remember, Jesus is the head of the church, 
And being that he is the head of the church, he is the one that distributes the ministry gifts to the church, pulling people out of the body to minister to the body. And so Paul's assignment as an apostle to the Gentiles will be simple. Uh, the simplicity of the gospel, y'all, it is simple. To open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me, meaning in, in Christ. Go to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. In verse 9. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 9. For this reason we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask. So now here is what Paul says that he wants to pray. And so he wants to pray for them about. And, and so this is very important that if you want to stay accurate with the scriptures as far as your prayer life is concerned, pray the word. Pray the word. Amen. Pray the word. Because the, his word shall not return to him void but it shall accomplish that which he pleases. For this reason we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. So you can form that in a prayer. Perfectly fine to form this in a prayer. Father, I ask that you, that you would fill me with the knowledge of your will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. So the knowledge in terms of where we get this knowledge from is the scriptures. We get the knowledge of his will from the scriptures. So we ask, we ask God, fill us with the knowledge of your will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Lord, I want to understand, not just to have wisdom, not to just, just to have knowledge, but to have understanding. In fact, go to the book of Proverbs chapter 4. The fourth chapter of the book of Proverbs. Look at verse 7. Proverbs 4 verse 7. Wisdom is the principal thing. Now whenever you see principal, we're not talking about principal in a public school. We're seeing principal as, uh, as lead, as head, as preeminent, as top. Wisdom is the principal thing. But you see, now we have to go and discover what the principal thing is. What, what, what is where, does, where does the principal thing start? Well, all you have to do is go to, go to chapter 1 of the book of Proverbs. And, and we'll find out what the, um, what the beginning, the, the beginning of the principal thing is. Look at verse 7. The fear, Proverbs chapter 1 verse 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. Don't make fun of wisdom and, inst uh, and instruction. Don't make fun of this. Because if, you, if, you, if you're hungry for wisdom, it'll keep you out of trouble. So the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but there's another place where we need to go to to see the, the, the beginning of the, the, the wisdom of God operating. And so look at uh, Proverbs 9 and verse 10. Proverbs 9 and verse 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. So when you're praying Colossians chapter 1, where it tells us that we that Lord, we ask that you would be that you would fill us with the knowledge of your will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Now you see verse 10 working. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. And then you tie that in with Proverbs chapter 4, where it says, chapter 4, where it says, wisdom is the principal thing. So the principal thing begins at the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. But don't despise 
wisdom and knowledge. Don't despise them. Don't despise it. Don't, don't say, I don't want to listen. Here, here, here you are doing some things and the Lord instructs you out of his heart, out of the word of God. And he said, don't do that. And he said, oh, I, I'm, I'm not going to pay attention to that. I'm just going to do it. And God says, I warned you. Wisdom says, I warned you. And then you go ahead and do that. Man, I wish I had listened. I mean, how many of us have ever said that after we, we thought about it and we went ahead and did it, but the Spirit of God warned us not to, and, 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 oh, and the wisdom in us told us not to. Oh, I'm going to do it anyway, and you did it, and he says, I wish I hadn't listened. I mean, I, I, could, I could be a wealthy man if I, can, if I can put money next to all the times that, that I've said to myself, man, I wish I had listened. And so now go back to Colossians. Colossians chapter 1. So wisdom is the principal thing. And then, then it says in, uh, in Proverbs 4. Then it says, uh, in all you're getting, get wisdom. And in all you're getting, get understanding. Get wisdom. But in all you're getting, get understanding. You see, it's not enough for you to just get wisdom. Get some understanding on that wisdom. Get some understanding on that wisdom. You, you want to make sure that you thoroughly understand the wisdom that God has given you and I. So when, when Paul is praying this prayer, this is exactly what, what, he's, what he's praying. Because we tied in uh, some things as far as the wisdom is concerned. Again, verse 9. For this reason, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. That For what purpose? That you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing, not decreasing, increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power for all patience and long suffering with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has made us qualified to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. The inheritance is eternal life. Because if you're a child, if you're, you're a child, if you're his child, then you're heir, a heir of God, a, heir, a joint heir with Christ. So we're talking about the eternal inheritance. And then when you go into Acts chapter 26, which we saw that Jesus said that we are to that we are to have this inheritance, that this inheritance will be given to those who are sanctified by faith in me, in Christ. Partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. The saints where? In light. He has delivered us from the power of darkness. So if you're wondering how, how Paul expounded on, on, on what Christ told him to do, this is the expounding or the play-by-play, uh, 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 -play, if you will, of people that are to be delivered from the power of darkness unto the power of light. From the power of Satan to the power of God, he has delivered us from the power of darkness and has conveyed us or translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. I know it says son of his love, but I just like the King James better. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. So can you see Acts chapter 26 working with Colossians chapter 1? The forgiveness of sins, redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. And that's the whole purpose of, of being the light of the world in, in, in terms of being in Christ. Now, like I've said before, you cannot be the light of the world independent of yourself. You have to have the light of the world in you in order to be the light of the world to others. Amen. You have to have the light of the world in you in order for you to be the light of the world to others. Because they need to see Christ in you, and that will draw them to the light. That's why Jesus said, don't hide your, your lamp under a basket, but put it on the table for everyone in the house to see. That's why we can't be ashamed of him. We can't be ashamed. We got to let it shine. I mean, if, if you're really, you know how we usually make some, some, some wild prayers? Lord, I want to go into the deep places with you. 
I want to go deep in you. And, and, and God's like, say, you don't know what you're asking. You see, at any time, God can use you and you don't know it. God, God can flush you out and, 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 and you won't know it till after it's all said and done. Because if you knew when it was going to happen, you would do everything in your power to put it under that basket. But because he needed you to be that light, he uses you before you can use your mind to stop him from using the light within you. I mean, there are many times you stand there in front of people and you really are ashamed. You don't want to talk about Jesus, don't want to talk about the word. And then all of a sudden you just find yourself talking about Jesus. And then after the fact, man, that was God. Yeah. Duh. It was God using the light within you because he wanted to pull that individual out of their dark places. So don't hide your light whether knowingly and sometimes, very rarely though, sometimes God will use you unknowingly and then next thing you know, the bag is out. The cat is out the bag. You'll find, you find yourself you know, talking about the word of God and, and you try to catch yourself but you're too far gone. You're too far down the road to stop it all now. You might as well just, you might as well just give them the whole spiel. Just give, just give them the whole word. All right, so, um, so we ought to be uh, this light that is shining. So, so that's what Paul is alluding to when he teaches about uh, 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 delivered us from the power of darkness and have translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Go into 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1. All right, look at verse 5, 1 John chapter 1, verse 5. This is the message which we have heard from him and, de and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. I mean, that was evident on the road to Damascus with Jesus that his light shined brighter than the sun. You know, at midday, at midday his light shined brighter than the sun. So, so here, there is, no, there is no darkness in him at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. So we have to be very careful not to be found as an individual uh, uh, walking in darkness. And then we say, where we are, we are the light. You know, you, you, you can't be both. You can't be in darkness and you can't exercise light at the same time. You're either one or the other. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So never get into that position that you commit a sin and that you're hopeless and that God has done with you and that he'll never use you again. Well, get cleaned up. Get cleaned up. I mean, <laughs> my life as well as many other people's lives are an example. Boy, were we in darkness. But God's mercy and grace cleaned us up. We, 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 we finally took a bath. Here we are stinking up the place, stinking up the house of God with sin, and then we finally come to our senses just like the prodigal son. The prodigal son came to his senses. And he said, he said, I'm going to go back to my father and, and tell him that I've sinned against heaven and against you. Make me one of your hired servants, for I'm not worthy to be your son. But what did the father do? He saw the repentance. He saw the repentance. And he ran and he kissed him. Look. I know brother man was filthy. Brother man was dirty. Dirty man, brother man had, had body odor on top of body odor. He didn't have a chance to wash up so that way his father can kiss a clean face. The father kissed him in the condition that he was in. Because he repented first. And then he said, bring the fatted, kill the fatted calf. Bring a robe on him. As filthy as he looked, bring a robe. Put a ring on him. For my son that was once dead is now alive. 
So never get into that place where you think that you're hopeless and that you'll never get out of sin and that you're condemned. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made us free from the law of sin and death. Never get into that position. I'm helpless. It's over. I'm done. And then you walk away forever. Knowing that you're still alive. Because see, if you're still alive, you still have a chance. Yes. God is not the God of a second chance. We, are, we, we blew the second chance a long time ago. God is the God of another chance. That's, that's his mercy and his grace. Not to condemn you, but to restore you. Praise God forevermore. It's to restore you. But there are times when we are so close. So close to checking out. Because we don't know when that, that one last time is spent. And we don't get another chance when we expire. That's why we have to be very careful because at any time God can pull the pin, God can pull our breath, God can stop our heart, so we shouldn't take advantage of the grace. We should never frustrate the grace of God. So John says in verse 7, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. So it doesn't mean that you get to just continuously tempt God. Oh, I'm going to get forgiven. I just want to enjoy this sin one more time. And you tempt him. Now you're playing with fire. But if we walk in the light, as, the whole purpose is for you to walk in the light as he is in the light. We have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. You know how some people think, I haven't sinned. I have no sin. Oh, wait a minute. Romans 3.23 says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Yeah, there is none that is good, the Bible says in the book of Psalm 14 and verse 1. So don't get so giddy that you say, I have no sin, because you're deceiving yourself. And not only deceiving yourself, but the truth is not in you. You're not being truthful. But look at this, verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Remember what we saw with Paul in Acts chapter 26, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance. They may receive an inheritance being sanctified by faith in me. You see, the whole purpose of the redemption of Christ is so that we don't sin. Remember what it says in Romans chapter 6 and verse 1. It says, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid, certainly not. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? We have to train and teach ourselves that we're not a part of the world anymore. We are now representatives of the head of the church and we are to be light at all times. If we confess our sins, he is, faithful, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar. Can, can you see the difference between what it says in verse 8? And verse 10, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. So if you have no sins, that means that you're perfect. And we all know that none of us is perfect. But here verse 10 is the differentiation between the two. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar. We call God a liar. You sin and then you tell him, I have not sinned. Well, you're making him a liar. You're making God a liar, and guess what? His word is not in you. So, we ought to walk in the light as he is in the light. 
Go to John chapter 14, because remember what we saw in uh, verse 5, I believe, of 1 John 1, uh, that uh, in him is no darkness at all. All right, so when Jesus appeared to Paul on the road to Damascus, he shone brighter than the sun. Here in John chapter 14 and verse 30, I will no longer walk, uh, I will no longer talk rather much with you. For the ruler of this world is coming, and I love this, and he has nothing in me. And he has nothing in me. You see, when we're developing in the walk of God, when we're walking with Jesus, it is to the point that the enemy has nothing in us. Because there's nothing in Christ. There's no darkness in him at all. And if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. And so there's a maintenance of this light. It is not just to have the light, it is not just to be in possession of the light, but it is also the maintenance of this light. So just like Jesus said of Satan, he's coming, but he has nothing in me, that's the place where we need to be. He has nothing in Christ, therefore our aim is for Satan to have nothing in us. Go to the book of Luke chapter 11. Luke, the 11th chapter. We're going to see uh, what is written in Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 and 14. In a slightly different way in Luke chapter 11, verse 33. Luke 11, verse 33. No one, when he has lit a lamp, puts it in a secret place or under a basket, but on a lampstand that those who come in may see the light. I mean, just imagine somebody knocks on your door and it's dark inside. And you tell them, come in. And they're like saying, but I can't see. So what are you going to do? You're going to turn on the lights. And that's the same with, with Christianity. Same thing with Christ in us. People want to come in, but if your house is dark, they can't see where they're going. So what does a person do? They put it on a lampstand that those who come in may see the light. The lamp of the body is thine. Now Jesus uses something a little bit different here. The lamp of the body is the eye. In other words, your physical eye is what you take in something and then you begin to process it with your brain, but it has the power to affect your whole body. So if you are in the light, you're, you only want to see things that, pro, that produces light within you. Therefore, the, the, the lamp, uh, rather the lamp of the body is the eye. Therefore, when your eye is good, what, what this means is that if your eye is sound, or if your eye is healthy, if your eye is sound and healthy, your whole body is full of light. But when your eye is bad, what does it mean for your eye to be bad? Blindness. Blindness. In other words, you're unable to process as a result of seeing what perhaps you may have, have seen. So if you're blind, you can't really process what you saw because you can't see. So if your eye is bad, you can't see. So then what happens if you can't see? What does Jesus say? Your whole body is full, your whole body is full of darkness. But when your eye is bad, your body is also full of darkness. Therefore take heed that the light which is in you is not darkness. If then your whole body is full of light, having no part dark, ties in with John chapter 14 verse 30, the prince of this world is coming but he has nothing in me, then your whole body is full of light, having no part dark. So see that confirms what I said a little while ago. The, the whole purpose is for you to have light and that Satan isn't in you to the point that you can say that there is no darkness 
in me. Just like Jesus said, the prince of this world is coming, but, there's no, but there is no darkness in me. If then your whole body is full of light, having no part dark, that's the objective, having no part dark, the whole body will be full of light as when the bright shining of a lamp gives you light. And so it's very important that we understand that what we see, what we take in, determines what's light and what's dark. What we take in determines what's light and what's dark. Go to Proverbs, the 20th chapter. Proverbs the 20th chapter, look at verse 27. Proverbs 20 and verse 27. The spirit of man is the lamp of the Lord, searching all the inner depths of the heart. The spirit of man is the lamp of the Lord, searching all the inner depths of the heart. So what is the inner man searching? What is this lamp searching? What is it searching? It's, it's good to know that we are to, that 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 our spirit man is always searching. We're always searching for something, right? Well, we're, we're if we're children of light, we should be allowing the word to search us. The Lord is providing that light within your spirit man to search all the depths. Remember that that we ought to have no part dark, right? So the word in us is searching for that dark part to make it light within us. Go to Psalm 119, Psalm 119 and verse 105. Psalm 119 verse 105. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. So when you tie this in with Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 27, that the spirit of man is the lamp of the Lord, searching all the inward parts of the belly. Well, or, or the, 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 the searching all the inward parts of the belly. Well, what is this searching? It is taking the word and searching in you to make sure that you have no part dark, no part dark. And that's why the word is constantly examining us, constantly examining us. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. You want to see where you're going, right? Allow the word entrance. Allow the word entrance. You're in Psalm 119. Go to the 130th verse. Allow the word entrance now. Allow the word entrance. Psalm 119 verse 130. The entrance of your word gives light. It gives understanding to the simple or the gullible. You see, I, I, I like what Jesus said here in, in, the book of, uh, in the book of Revelation. As far as the, uh, the, uh, the Laodicean church. In fact, go to the uh, book of Revelation chapter 3 and verse 14. Revelation chapter 3, look at verse 14. And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things says the Amen. Remember when Jesus said, I'm Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. All, thing, all, all the promises of God are yea and amen. These things says the Amen. He is the finish, finisher of our faith. The author and the finisher of our faith, the Bible says in the book of Hebrews uh, uh, it tells us that he is the author and the finisher of our faith. Look at this. These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of, of the creation of God. The beginning of the creation of God, well, that ties in with Colossians chapter 1, that he is the image of the invisible God. All things were created by him, and by him all things consist. And then John chapter 1 and verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, the same was in the beginning with God. So he is the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were cold or hot. Preferably, if you were cold, God knows how to bring heat. You know how God brings heat? Persecution. 
keep you hot. He brings persecution to keep you hot. If you're cold now. Now, if you're already hot, you don't have to worry about it. You're going to be persecuted whether you're cold or hot. Doesn't make a doesn't make a difference. But I wish you were either cold or hot, Jesus said. So, brethren, because you are lukewarm, so then rather, so then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, you're neither one of those things. He, they're in the middle. You see, in, in politics, you, you have left center and right center. But we're not here to engage in politics. With the, with the word, we're not supposed to be left center or right center. We're supposed to be dead in the middle. I mean, uh, either cold or hot, but preferably hot. We're not supposed to be in the middle as far as lukewarm is concerned. We're not to be lukewarm. But because you are lukewarm and neither cold or hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Soup is supposed to be hot. Soup is supposed to be hot. Now, I understand that there are some individuals that love to drink their soup cold or even lukewarm, but it doesn't, it doesn't taste the same. I mean, I, I like my food well done. I don't like my eggs over easy. It's running all over the place. Nah. Some people like that, but I'm not like that. But as far as spiritual is concerned, God does not want us lukewarm. I wish you were either cold or hot. If you're cold, I can make you hot. If you're hot, stay hot. But because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. You see, whenever you have those individuals that, that always have those confessions about, I'm rich, I'm wealthy, I don't need nothing. Here Jesus is identifying them as wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Because your, your mind is on earthly things. It's not on heavenly things. It's not on Christ. It's all on how much money you can get, how much riches you can uh, 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 get, how many houses you can have. You can only live in one at a time. How many cars you have. You can only drive one car at a time. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in fire that you may be rich and, and white garments that you may be clothed that the, that the shame of your nakedness may not, may not be revealed and anoint your eyes with eye salve so uh, that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. See, that ties in with the book of Hebrews chapter 12. Because if he didn't love you, he wouldn't chasten you. If our parents didn't love us, they wouldn't beat us. They, 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 would, they, would, they would applaud us running around like fools in Times Square. Man, I remember one parent, one parent she, wasn't, she wasn't no saved, no more saved than, than the man in the moon. But she saw her child on TV acting a fool. And she got up and says, I know who's that's my son. And she got up and 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 did old school on him. He didn't, she didn't care how big he was. She beat him like my mama would beat me. <laughs> I mean, don't I, look, I don't care how old they get. They acting a fool. You as a parent got every right to stop them and beat the living daylights out of them. Half kill them as my mama. I'm going to half kill you. You got every right because if you didn't love your child, you wouldn't even bother. You would sit there and let the worst happen to them. But you see, in giving them the discipline that they need, what you're doing is that you're preventing three things from happening. Number one, visiting their grave. Number two, visiting them in prison. Or number three, visiting them while they're homeless on the street with a plate of food to feed them. You'll avoid those three things if you discipline your child. You know your child is up to doing wrong and you don't discipline them. You don't love them. So as many as I love, Jesus says in verse 19, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. 
He's not standing at the door of the sinner. He's standing at the door of those that profess to be righteous. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne. Here's the reward. He shows the discipline and as a result of the chastening, he shows the punishment. He gives the punishment, but here's the reward for those that overcome. I will grant to him with me, I will grant to sit I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So the entrance of his word gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. Go to the book of Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. Look at verse 17. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 17. Remember the theme of the fact that we are we have come out of darkness and into his marvelous light. We have been we, we, we have been delivered from the power of darkness and the power of darkness and have been translated into the kingdom of, it, of his dear son. Look at the same theme that, that we see Paul give in terms of the, the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Look at verse 17 in Ephesians chapter 1. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened. Now remember what we saw in the book of Luke chapter 11 when Jesus said that we are, that if our eye is good, then our body will be full of light. That the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling. And what, uh, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? And again, I want to point out that it's not talking about house, money, cars, or clothing. It is talking about your eternal inheritance in Christ as far as the new birth is concerned. Because it ties in with the book of Acts chapter 6, uh, 26 and verse 17. That, that, that Jesus wants to have an inheritance by those who are sanctified by faith in me, in Christ. So this is the same theme of inheritance. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe? What, what is this power to us who believe? This is not talking about ministering power to others, but the power of the resurrection that is in Christ that is now in us. Because Paul, pray, Paul uh, wrote in Philippians chapter 3 that we have not yet apprehended, or I have not yet apprehended, that the power of Christ in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul said that the power of Christ may rest upon me. But in, uh, uh, in that passage where, where in, in Philippians he speaks of that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. That, see, that's the eternal life that is working on the inside of us. We ought to know the power of his resurrection because that ties in with Romans chapter 6. That we were buried with him in baptism and that we were raised up that we may walk in newness of life. That's the eternal inheritance that is working on the inside of us. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name uh, that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. All right. So. That's the illumination that is working on the inside of us. That when we observe the word, the word is on the inside working in us. That eternal inheritance so that way we can walk in newness of life. Go to John chapter 3. John chapter 3 and verse 18. John, the gospel of John chapter 3 and verse 18. He who believes in him is not condemned. See, that ties in with Romans chapter 8 and verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. All right, so continuing here in verse 18. But he who does not believe is condemned already. Because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Because he, if you say that you believe in, in him, then do what 1 John 5 tells us. That if we walk in the light 
As he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. You see, if we believe in the Son of the living God, then the light is working in us the way that it ought to in terms of walking in the commandments of the Lord. Because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world. And men love darkness rather than light. That's why, that's why you know, remember when you were, you were unsaved and someone approached you with the gospel and you turned immediately? Well, that, that shows, that what is that? that? That reveals that you didn't want to see the light. You didn't want to have anything do, to do with Christ who is the light. But now that you're in Christ, man, we all up in this light. We're all up in this light. And this is the condemnation that the light has come into the world. And men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. And everyone practicing evil hates the light. So that's why you can, that's why we have to check ourselves. Because if you're practicing evil, you hate the light. But if you're practicing righteousness, you love the light. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be clearly seen that they have been done in God. And so that's why you need to take with a grain of salt anyone that says, I'm a Christian, but you know they're living in sin. Take with a grain of salt everybody that says, I'm a Christian, but they're still sleeping with their boyfriend. Hmm. Uh, you you, you got to watch individuals that are Christians in name only. We, if we name the name of Christ, we depart from iniquity. If we name the name of Christ, we depart from iniquity. In fact, go there in 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy. Second Timothy chapter 2. Look at verse 17. And their message will spread like cancer. Hymenaeus and Philetus are, Philetus are of this sort, who have strayed concerning the truth, saying that the resurrection is already past, and they overthrow the faith of some. Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands, having this seal. The Lord knows those who are his. So you can claim any kind of name you want. But if you his, well, the Lord knows those who are his. And let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Depart from it. You have no business if you name on the name of Christ. Depart from iniquity. Finally, go to the book of Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 8. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 8, where it says, For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. So the fruit of the Spirit is connected to walking in the light. Finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. You've been listening to the Prevailing Word Podcast. We're on Apple Podcast, Amazon Podcasts, Spotify, and Spreaker. The Minister's Crucible and Prevailing Word Live is on YouTube. There's exclusive content for ministers of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ found at theministerscrucible.com. Follow Prevailing Word Ministries Incorporated and The Minister's Crucible on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. I'm Fred Rochester. Thanks for listening. Thank you.